Well, welcome to our listeners to WPVM FM 103.7 uh, in the heart of Asheville. Uh, I'm Bob Orr, and it's my pleasure today to do an interview with Judge Darren Jackson, the incumbent uh, judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals and a candidate for election in the November race. Judge Jackson, welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me, Justice Ford. Well, it, it's it's my pleasure. We're looking forward to talking uh, with you. Uh, I, I, I want to start the, the first part, uh, give you a chance to tell listeners a little bit about your your background and experience, uh, you know, family and uh, the things that you've been engaged in over the years. So tell us about yourself. Well, yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. Um, D- Darren Jackson, born and raised in eastern Wake County, who went to the public schools in the area, um, went off, to, graduated from high school in 1988, went to UNC Chapel Hill for undergraduate, where I was on the five-year plan and got a, um, got a degree in political science, um, then went to Duke University School of Law, and yeah, I got when I graduated ask, there, I, I returned. I, I want to know, how was it transitioning from being a Tar Heel to going to school at Duke? Um, it, it was really easy um, in that I was at Duke. Um, during the three years I was at Duke, Duke never beat Carolina in basketball. <laughs> so Carolina won all the games. Um, that was uh, that was during when Coach K hurt his back and was out yeah. part of the season. Um, that included the 1994 uh, year where the national championship was held in Charlotte, and everybody thought that Duke and Carolina were actually going to play that year yeah. in the national championship. Um, but Carolina lost, I think, in the round of eight and didn't make the final four that year. Um, so, but it, but it was a good time to be there. It's good. All right, sorry to interrupt, but I had to ask that. No, question. no. So yeah. you know, after after finishing law school, I returned back home to Eastern Wake County. Um, and went to work in a small firm. Uh, there were three of us at one time. It, it varied between three and four lawyers over 25 years I was there. Um, doing general practice, I did mostly civil litigation. Um, I did appellate work. I, I did really everything except I, I didn't do too much domestic. We always had a domestic partner who handled custody and child support and things of that nature. We never did really any immigration, any immigration law. Um, and I did little bankruptcy. I, I would represent a creditor here and there in bankruptcy court, but certainly never represented any debtors in bankruptcy court, but really did everything. I mean, that's part of the fun of being in a small town. Um, well, I say fun. You, you really can't afford to turn down a lot of clients. Um, and, but, you know, you get it, you get exposed. You don't get, pigeonholed into necessarily uh, doing this or that specialty. And so you get to see a lot of different areas of the law. Um, even, and, and then being in Eastern Wake County, um, we really had a very busy practice through the Eastern part of the state, although I've been to the Western part of the state too. So when I started campaigning, I counted it up. I, I've been in like 43, 44 county courthouses practicing law in different counties. Um, I think I've been in eight or nine federal courthouses practicing law in those. So you really got to see how different the system worked in different counties or preferences. And, and it, it, it was it's, it was enjoyable, but it was also um, eye opening um, to see the difference in how justice is done from county to county, from region to region in the state. And so, uh, so I was at there 25 years. Yeah. So now at some point you decided to run for the General Assembly and were elected. Tell us about that. So. I did. I've, I've always been interested in public service and uh, people uh, find it funny. But um, at the time that I put my name in the hat for the General Assembly, that was actually the smallest office I could run for because um, our in Wake County, um, our county commissioners were elected countywide, right. as were our school board members at the time. 
And um, I didn't live in a city or municipality. I lived in the county, out in the county, in the rural part. And so um, actually house was actually the smallest seat you could run for. Uh, it was also supposedly part time. And right. so that it didn't require me to give up my law practice. Um, I, I, I generally don't complain about the hours because I was very fortunate in that um, I was able to go home every night. People. Right. Uh, like yourself from the mountains or people from the coast who had to drive up and spend Monday through Thursday didn't get that same opportunity. Whereas when I had a break at the journal somewhere, I could run down to the courthouse and do a title search or take care of some tickets or so, you know, right. something like that, file some pleadings. Um, so I, I was very lucky in that, in that my location allowed me to be able to do both. So plus you, great partners. Yeah. Yeah. So you, yeah, you got to have good, good, good folks working with. And I have to say now, I, Am I correct that you and Court of Appeals Chief Judge Donna Stroud, who is running on the Republican ticket for her seat, practiced law together for a while? That's right. Eight years. Uh, it was eight years. Uh, she was uh, one of the two partners who hired me. Um, it's, uh, it's a really uh, interesting story since usually you can't tell it in a five minute interview, but for purposes <laughs> of the day, I, I can tell yeah. it. Um, sure. Yeah. So, um, I actually, after my first year of law school, I was called to serve on a jury. And um, and so I, I didn't think that, that either party was going to lead me on as a law student. Um, and uh, Chief Judge Stroud and her partner, Andy Gay, were the plaintiff's attorneys. Uh -huh. And um, and so I was left on the jury. And um and so I heard the case. Um, I, I learned a lot. I'm really glad I got to serve on a jury before I, I, I became a lawyer because I learned a lot. In, in, in particular, I learned that um, there was a limiting instruction in the case. The judge told us not to consider something that we had heard. And the first thing that happened when we went to the jury box is uh, in the back. Somebody said, hey, how about that evidence? You know, Um <laughs> It, it, so you, you kind of learn how things really work. And yeah, so, yeah. but then, and so then uh, they were in Wendell at that time. And so I think my second year I applied for a summer job with them at, with their firm. They were the biggest firm in my area. Um, I did not get that job. And then sometime in my third year, um, I got a magnet in the mail, you know, one of those things they send right. you like, businesses on it. And I saw that uh, Chief Judge Stroud and her partner, Andy Gay, had gone out on their own in Zebulon and started their own firm. And so I reached out uh, to Mr. Gay and asked him if he would be, consider hiring me. Um, and so they did. And so that's that's where I got started. So was it, I, I won't say odd, but how did it feel to go from having practiced law with Donna Stroud to being on the court with Judge Donna Stroud was an easy transition. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. we, we, and, and both Andy and I knew that Donna would one day be a, a judge, an appellate judge. Uh, she was a wonderful writer um, and enjoyed uh, writing and appellate work and things like that. And so, um, it did not surprise me at all when she ran for the Court of Appeals for the first time. And um, we, we had stayed in touch. You know, she came to our annual Christmas parties. We, our right. firm was a close firm. We still invited her and her husband to our Christmas parties every year. So we kind of stayed in touch. And um, and so, yeah, she was the first person to reach out to me when she heard that I got the appointment. Right. Yeah, we'll talk more about the judgeship here in a few minutes. But tell us a little bit about your family. And I know you've been involved in a lot of educational issues both personally and um certainly when you were in the legislature yeah so um i'm married my wife tina is an adult nurse practitioner here in, at carry cardiology which is a large cardiology practice she does hospital rounds at the local hospitals uh three children our oldest Alyssa, is a teacher uh here at a local middle school in raleigh uh, our son, Logan, recently graduated from UNC Chapel Hill and is working in a nonprofit in Durham. And our youngest son, Jack, is a, a junior at Appalachian State. Yeah, okay. um, and, and he is having the time of his life this semester, <laughs> yeah, as right, you can right. imagine. He he actually made the TV on college game day. So oh, he's really, really excited. 
pretty exciting. <laughs> well, I, I will have to say my grandson is uh, a sophomore at App State, and I, I did go to the Carolina App State game, which we could spend the rest of your interview time talking about uh, about football, but we won't. Uh, but, but it was it's pretty exciting in, in a lot of different ways. Um, so uh, at, at a certain point in time, a vacancy occurred after the 2020 election on the Court of Appeals and under the state constitution, the governor appoints to fill a vacancy and Governor Cooper reached out to you uh, about taking that vacancy. Yes, that's right. I, I actually, um, there had been a vacancy on the court, I guess, about a year and a half earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and I had actually reached out to the governor's office and, and, and expressed interest in um, do, doing that. And, um, the, you know, the timing just wasn't right for, for the governor's office. You know, they had somebody else in mind, but I had to ask them to keep me in mind. And so when another vacancy came up, they gave me a call. And so it was... Um, it was it was a good time having just finished the the election, uh, getting ready to start um, a redistricting cycle. Um, it, it seemed like a good time for us. Um, I had uh, had set a personal goal to only serve in leadership in, in the House leadership for four years. I, I felt like four years was long enough, and then then you should step aside and let somebody else have an opportunity. Um, kind of. I don't know. If, I don't know if pecking orders to write, but there's yeah. different different order, you know, different levels, and so everybody is can move up and do something different and grow, and and, and I think that's really what public services is, is about. And so uh, Robert Rees was more than ready to be uh, House Democratic leader, and so I was I was excited to be able to give him that opportunity and uh, give myself an opportunity to do do something a little different. Um, really i really love the law and um it, it just seemed like a good time to do to, so, to change so for the for, for the benefit of our listeners the court of appeals is our intermediate appellate court right below the uh north carolina supreme court it's 15 member court uh the judges sit in panels of three uh and so tell us sort of briefly about you know, your experience uh, as a relatively, as a new judge, and then as you've transitioned into your second year on the court. What, what's it yeah, been like? I, I, yeah. I, I would say that um, as far as when, when I became a new judge, so I got sworn in somewhere around January 5th, January 6th, and we had a, I had my first panel in a couple of weeks, so I had to hire staff and get up and running. I, you know, had four opinions to write, that first panel and then two weeks later I had four more opinions and then two <laughs> weeks later, four more opinions. And so I think the fact that I had practiced such a general practice and had been exposed to so many different areas of the law was a huge benefit to me. Um, you know, I think on that first, uh, you know, not only do we have criminal and civil cases, uh, we have appeals from the industrial commission, some from the utility commission, administrative agencies, municipal uh, government types of you know appeals. I had done all of those. I had, I had and so um, with very few exceptions, do I have to try to figure out oh what chapter in our statute books is that particular area of law, or at, at least knew wasn't an expert in everything. Of course not, but but knew where to start at. And so I think with the quick time frame of from the appointment to having to hear, hear that first case, I think that experience was very helpful. Now, over the last 20 months, of course, we've been able to settle in. Um, and, you know, I, I have learned a lot. I learned a lot. I've served, I've served on panels with every other judge at least once or twice here. Um, I really like the Court of Appeals. What I, what I what I one of the things I like about the Court of Appeals is um, I'm really impressed with the quality of young people that we are able to hire as clerks. Um, you know, it, it, as far I mean, the, the pay is good, you know, compared to what the average North Carolinian makes, but it's not we're nowhere near what they could get in a private law firm. 
um, coming out of law school, you know, people at the top of their class and everything. And so we get some really, really good clerks. And I view it as a really good opportunity to mentor um, because they write uh, better than I do in, yeah. in some instances. Um, but they've never been in a courtroom. And there's a lot about r- real law that's different from paper law, in my opinion. Um, and so I get to bring a, a little bit of my experience to them on a daily basis. Um, it was a little tough when we were during COVID and a lot of people were working from home for safety and everything. But now that we are all back in the office, I think it's really good to be able just for them to be able to just knock on my door and come in my office and sit down and ask a question about, you know, practical things and how, how it really operates on a day-to-day basis in our courtrooms across the state. So I've, I've enjoyed that as well, the mentorship. Well, I, that's, that is an important uh, aspect. I always said, if you hire really smart law clerks, they make you look a lot smarter as, as a judge. Um, and so I, I think it's important to make sure your listeners understand. And I'm talking with judge Darren Jackson of the court of appeals, uh, I assume the the name is there, but I just want to, you know, emphasize it, that uh, the Court of Appeals is the court where virtually every appeal from the trial uh, courts of the state go to. Uh, John Martin, a former chief judge, used to refer to it as the the workhorse of the court system. Uh, It has a much, much larger caseload than the Supreme Court does. Uh, which has um, a limited number of cases going to it. Um, so ha- how have you found the workload? Doable, but important to stay on. And um, it, it's important because uh, dealing with different judges who like to do things differently from one another and from myself, um, that you need to be able to have several cases up in the air at one time. You know, if you, you might be through your final draft on one opinion that you're waiting to circulate and hear back from them. But before you can finish that, you need to be working on the next case and then circulating that with a different set of judges. And so I think it's very important to, to, to be able to handle multiple things and not, I mean, some people just have to finish one thing before they can move to the next right. thing. That That's a little hard when you're waiting on two other judges to sign off on things. I think you have to be very well organized um, to keep up with your cases and, and not let them uh, fall through the cracks um, because um, some, some judges take a little longer to review than others. Some will have a lot more, comments, you know, a lot more requested edits than others. Um, And then a lot of judges, you know, want to take the time to sit down and chat about things and talk through things. And always, I find that very beneficial. But um, you just have to be able to say, okay, I had that two weeks ago on my desk. Now let me think about what I was thinking when I wrote that. And so I sent it to you. Um, And and so I think organization is very key in, in being successful in the job. I'm not getting not getting far behind because the cases just keep coming. Right. Well, yeah, I, I want to transition into the campaign because the reason we're interviewing you is because you are a candidate for election in, in November. Uh, but in doing so, uh, the Court of Appeals, uh, 15 members, and I believe um, I, I should have gone and counted, but it's pretty evenly divided, even though you can't evenly divide 15, uh, among actually, elected Republicans and elected Democrats. Actually, after the last election, it's really not. It's uh, 10 Republicans to five Democrats. Uh, okay. So it's, yeah. See, when, when I was there, it was one Republican to 11 Democrats. So, right. You know, and, and, and to pit, you know, the last several elections, um, the parties have swept, whether it's the Demo- it being the Democrats winning all the court seats in 18 that were on the yeah. ballot or the Republicans winning all of the ones that were on the ballot in 20. Um, if that happens this time, the ballots could be as much as 12 Republicans to three Democrats. Um, so so in, in that context, and I, I know from personal experience, it is a challenge to work with fellow judges who happen to be of the other political party 
and then an election cycle hits and all of a sudden you are divided into essentially two teams, the Republican team and the uh, Democratic team. Have, have you found that to be a problem or a challenge in from, from a work standpoint now that everybody's in the throes of a campaign? You know, I, I, I haven't, as, as far as a working standpoint, I haven't seen any real issues um, with it. You know, you would anticipate if it was um, if it was going to be an issue, it might be an issue with people of the opposite party that are on the ballot this year with me right. and um, certainly have not had that problem at all. Um, I, I imagine that um, before certain judges who might want to run for different offices in the future or anything before they agree to concur with a opinion written by judge Jackson, they might look at it really hard to make sure there's nothing in there that's going to be used against them. But, you know, my theory is the same way it was um, in the general assembly. Um, I used to tell people all the time, you should make the vote that you think is right for you, yourself, your conscience, your constituents. Uh, don't worry about what the other party is going to say um, because they're going to make it up. They're going to lie about you anyway. <laughs> they're going to, they're going to, even if you vote for the bill, if there's another Democrat that votes against it, they're going to say Democrats are against this or that. And, and right. so it's the same thing. You know, you, you can't be worried. If, you, if you're worried about political pressure or, um, where the newspapers going to run an article about how you ruled in a certain case. I, I just don't think being a judge is the right profession for you. Uh, I mean, you're not supposed to care who wins the case. Um, and on the court of appeals, because like you said, there's 15 of us and we sit in only panels of three, it's really easy to take a recusal. And, and I do that often. Um, as you might expect, I have, potential conflicts from my service in the General Assembly on issues that I worked on or bills that I passed and everything. And it, it's just real easy to take a recusal and get another judge to sub in. Um, and so, you know, if I find myself as if an issue that I say, oh, you know, I was very passionate about that issue when I was in the General Assembly, I just recuse myself. And, and that's, the, that's, the, that's the right way to do it, I think. So, <clears throat> so, Obviously, a statewide judicial race is significantly different uh, and more challenging than a very localized legislative race. Tell the listeners how you've gone about trying to campaign for your judgeship from Murphy to Manio uh, and the, the challenges um, and issues that you think are important for them to, to hear about. Yeah, it, it is very challenging. It is, um, I'm going to say, um, it is extremely challenging for judges on the Court of Appeals um, who don't raise the kind of funds that will be raised for the Supreme Court races. You know, I anticipate whether it's mail or television, the, the, can, uh, the candidates on both sides of the aisle for Supreme Court will have a very good campaign treasury to run. We really don't see that on the Court of Appeals. And so, it's it's uh it's it's work it's driving um I I I, I figured it up last week because you have to keep keep up with these kind of things I put fifteen hundred miles on my car driving back and forth all over the state I, and you don't Saturday, have a driver I, you don't you have that's right I don't have a driver yeah um, yeah yeah I started in uh, Benson at the Mule Days Parade and ended up in Black Mountain at a picnic in the park. Um, and, you know, that's what you have to do um, uh, in order to campaign for Court of Appeals, try to get your name out. Um, you know, any kind of invitation I get, especially from nonpartisan groups, I try to attend. Um, in, a, in a weird kind of way, COVID has helped that in that um, a lot of groups are still doing Zoom meetings. Um, and so sometimes it makes it able, makes it a, where I'm able to do two events in one night, maybe one in person and then jump on a Zoom call and catch a second one, um, which is really nice. Um, whereas I would have in the past probably had to pick between the two. 
Yeah. Um, uh, any but, issues, uh, you know, one of the challenges, uh, judges are limited by the code of judicial conduct. So there, there's certain certain limitations on what you can do as a candidate. Um, uh, are, are there any issues, though, that have come up that you think are important for the voters to know uh, and, and, and what there is about uh, your candidacy versus uh, – your opponents that they should they should know from you. Yeah, you know, I, you hope that people will just take the time to to get to know the candidates and get educated on the issues. Unfortunately, so many people, um, when they vote for judges, they do one or two things. They either vote by the party. Um, you know, we've been back to being partisan races for I guess three or four cycles now. Um, or they leave it blank because they don't know the candidates. Um, and so it's my job to reach out to those who are willing to consider, you know, voting for myself or someone to try to get them educated. Uh, like you said, it, we can't really talk about the issues, but but I think you can talk about balance. I talk about balance on our courts and how important it is. Um, and I also talk about experience because I, I think experience is important and it's not just that i've been on the court for 20 months and so i've written 110 opinions that anybody can go look up and judge for themselves how well i'm doing um you know i i it's the experience i had practicing law for 25 years before coming on the bench um and so i talk about that a lot i when I talk about balance, you know, I talk about that in this campaign, I have been endorsed by both the plaintiff's attorney's organization and the defense attorney organization. So those are two groups that generally don't agree on anything and they're on each side of every, you know, issue or, or every civil litigation case. And yet they both have endorsed me in my candidacy. And my guess is that the both groups do a very thorough look at your opinions and the things that you've done. And so to me, that speaks to balance as well, that, you know, that they can see that I am not unfairly prejudiced against one side or for another side, but that I'm looking at the facts and the law of each individual case. Yeah. And, 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 you know, that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Right. And, and I probably should have asked this in the context of uh, the second part, talking about the judgeship. But you've been a legislator, and I think you are the only member of the Court of Appeals that has served as a legislator. There yes, the, 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 uh, the Court of Appeals. Uh, right. Justice Barringer, of course, was also in the General right. Assembly on for Court. a few terms. But, yeah. Yes, but, sir. Uh, I, so, I, think, I think it was more common in the past than it is right. now. Right. And, and so, you know, there's this huge uh, uh, sort of philosophical battle between the role of the legislature and the role of the courts. And you have the unique perspective of having served in both branches of government. And so sort of on a final word here before we bring Judge Stroud in for, for her uh, discussion, um, you, you want to talk a little bit about th that, that tension between the power of the legislature and the power of the judiciary to review acts of the legislature? Uh -huh. So certainly it's something that comes up and will probably come up again. And so you have to be careful what you talk about. I, I think that my service in the legislature um, has given me a healthy view of uh, the deference due to the legislative branch, um, while also probably I, I doubt that any judge is as good at doing legislative history research as I am. And so, um, and, and it has actually come up in several of my cases in that I've looked at some cases and said, I saw some Court of Appeals findings and said, wait a minute, you know, that's not exactly what the legislature meant. And the reason why I knew that is because there was an amendment ran to do exactly that that was voted down. Yeah. Um, and so, you, you know, that kind of experience helps, I think. Um, but I, I do recognize that we are, I, I am not, it is no longer my job to write the law. Um, okay. That is the legislative branch uh, to the extent that the Supreme Court comes up with new interpretations or something changes. You know, we follow both uh, the Court of Appeals, prior precedent, and of course the Supreme Court. And, and I realize that that is my job. I think I probably made some people uncomfortable moving directly over from the legislative branch to the judicial branch. But I think now after 
20 months, they can look and see it's not been a problem at all. All right. Great. Well, Judge Darren Jackson, thank you so much. I'm going to ask uh, Judge Stroud about your why they hired you as an associate. Uh, uh, see, see what she says about that. But uh, th thank you so much for taking time to talk with us. Good luck on the rest of the campaign and keep up the good work. Uh, thank you. And uh, we'll we'll do a slight transition now uh, over to our next guest.